Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of the MFC conference, Social Finance by Pandemic Reboot. And we hope that you enjoyed the sessions of yesterday. Um, I personally enjoyed them very much. Kasia, did you? I did as well. Very good. So let us first acknowledge the sponsors of this event. Um, European Commission is the strategic sponsor. They, um, they provide a lot of support to microfinance in Europe, uh, mainly through the program called EASY. You heard about it yesterday. It consists of uh, financial and non-financial instruments to support the development of uh, microfinance. It is important for you to know that uh, recently the non-financial instruments have become part of the program called ESF Plus, which is uh, European Social Fund Plus. It's a main EU instrument to support, to invest in people, uh, while the financial instruments have become part of InvestEU, which is a new European investment program. Our gold sponsor, European Investment Bank Group, consists of three institutions, European Investment Bank, European Investment Fund, and European Investment Bank Institute. Microfinance institutions uh, receive investment from EIB and EIF. MFC coll coll collaborates closely with three members of the group, but in particular with uh, the EIB Institute, which uh, contributes to MFC program such as Digital Bootcamp or CEO Forum. Throughout this conference, the EIB group prepared an impressive program for you, and we would like to encourage you to attend the following sessions today. At 10.30, um, there is a session, actually long-awaited session on EIF inclusive finance programs. Uh, this session will also feature the InvestEU program that Grzegorz just mentioned yesterday at the Investors Forum. You have had you had many questions uh, to some more close about this program and other um, EU program support. So this is your unique chance to, to go to this session and ask all the questions and get clarifications on any of the issues that you might have. At 11.30, uh, the EIB group will provide an opportunity to hear about the advisory support for the SME and microfinance sector in Serbia. You should also not miss the opportunity at 1 p.m. to join the session on social finance continuum, where the leaders of three networks, uh, Europe Route, Europe, European Venture Philanthropy Association, and us at Microfinance Center, we will, we will discuss the recent trends uh, in those um, uh, areas, uh, complementing areas of social finance. So please uh, come and join us. Uh, European Fund for Southeast Europe is the brand sponsor of this event. It's, it's one of the crucial institutions in Europe to provide support for microfinance institutions in the region. They also have their development facility that provides technical assistance to, to microfinance institutions and civil society organizations such as MFC. We also benefit from support from FC. Uh, for instance, our digital bootcamp is sponsored by FC. Um, I would like also to acknowledge other sponsors of this event. The Frankfurt School for Finance and Management is our academic partner, also Responsibility and Singlify. We're also very proud to work with uh, FinDev, our media partner. Let us also acknowledge various partners that contributed, contributed to the development of uh, this event's agenda, uh, which is really broad and diverse, with over 40 sessions and over 100 speakers. And our special thanks go to Center for Financial Inclusion, MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, SIGAP and New York University Wagner, as well as European networks, Euclid, Reuse, Europe Route, EVPA, and last but not least, the country-level associations, and in particular, Albanian Microfinance Association, Association of Microfinance Institutions from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgian Microfinance Association, and Association of Microfinance Institutions from Kyrgyzstan. Thank you all for supporting this event. We're about to start a few exciting sessions, uh, but before we do that, I am very honored and happy uh, to announce the keynote address by Tim Ogden, Tim is Managing Director of Financial Access Initiative, a research center housed at New York 
University Wagner. Currently, Tim manages uh, a project called Sentinel. It is about investigating, researching impact of the COVID crisis on microfinance institutions. And the MFC is very privileged to be the main Sentinel partner for Europe and Central Asia. So, Tim, over to you. Hello, I'm Tim Ogden, Managing Director of the Financial Access Initiative, a research center housed at NYU Wagner focused on how financial services can better meet the needs and improve the lives of poor households around the world. And it's very good to be with you this year. Uh, the last time I spoke to an MFC conference was in Istanbul in 2019. And uh, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person this year, but very pleased that MFC has continued its important work supporting microfinance uh, in uh, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet republics. I'm here today to talk about what's next for microfinance based on what we've seen for the last year, year and a half. And if uh, you follow anything uh, that we've done at FAI, you're probably aware that I was one of the people at the beginning of the pandemic talking about the very dark clouds uh, confronting the industry, that the pandemic was an existential crisis for microfinance, different from other crises we've seen in microfinance. That this was the first time we'd seen a situation where uh, both local economies and the global economy were disrupted simultaneously. And that that would present both challenges for, uh, for customers, for borrowers, for customers of microfinance and uh, for the uh, MFIs themselves and accessing funding because uh, funding would be tight from funders and governments alike. And so I perceive that this could get, get very, very bad. Um, the, what we've seen uh, in the last year though is that the picture has looked more like this. Certainly there are plenty of dark clouds, but we've also seen an incredible amount of resilience from uh, microfinance institutions and NBFIs and others providing financial services to low-income households around the world, and uh, lots of uh, uh, possibilities, lots of resilience, lots of reason for optimism and hope as these institutions have responded to the needs around them and supported their customers through this uh, very challenging time, supported their staff, uh, supported their communities. And so uh, I want to begin by saying, you know, I was one of those people uh, who was very pessimistic about what we would see. And I've been uh, very, very happy to see that uh, my predictions have not been borne out. Now, uh, FAI has been uh, a hub for something called the Sentinel Project, which is something that we launched this uh, spring. Uh, the idea is uh, of the Sentinel Project is to track what's happening in global microfinance, uh, not systematically, you know, the uh, with hundreds or thousands of MFIs, but with some key uh, microfinance institutions around the world, what we call sentinels, um, and keep track of how they're managing. So over the course of the last six to nine months, we've been regularly interviewing uh, a, te a team of researchers has been regularly interviewing uh, MFIs from uh, various uh, parts of the world, uh, including participation from MFC and a number of MFIs that are part of the microfinance centers network. and. We've seen, obviously, a lot of difference, but a lot of commonalities. And as I said, a lot of reasons for, for hope and encouragement as the MFIs have been managing staff, figuring out how to keep uh, staff safe, but also employed uh, with regular income, helping customers manage the, uh, the situation that they're in with lockdowns and shutdowns and restarts and emergency liquidity. Uh, we've seen uh, MFIs evolving their operations trying to figure out how to use digital tools, both to receive payments and to connect and communicate with customers and to support staff. Uh, we've seen some really interesting innovative products, new liquidity loans, um, new uh, restart loans, um, various kinds of um, grace periods and uh, uh, other ways of allowing customers to stay in good standing uh, while recognizing the situation that, uh, that they, they're in. And we've seen a, a good amount of support from reg regulators, government agencies, and funders to make sure that MFIs could continue their vital work. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to keep track of the Sentinel Project. You can find it on the financialaccess.org page. We've just been publishing some of the results from our first rounds of interviews, and you'll continue to see things there over the coming year. Uh, and we'll return to this question of 
uh, how the, the crisis has evolved uh, a bit later. Now, uh, it, I wouldn't be me if I didn't come at this and say, uh, despite the silver linings we've seen on some of the dark clouds, I still think uh, what's ahead is a very uncertain path. It's really not clear where we go from here uh, for many institutions, uh, for many uh, countries, for many uh, sets of customers. Because the pandemic is not over, we're seeing uh, surges. We're, we likely haven't seen the last variant of the COVID virus. Vaccination rates uh, and the availability of vaccines are still proceeding far more slowly than uh, we could hope for. And so it's unclear how economies, uh, how customers will evolve uh, and adapt how NFIs will adapt to uh, the uncertainty ahead. And so I wanna talk about what we see and the possibilities, but also some concerns uh, about what's coming in the next year for microfinance. So as we think about that road ahead, um, first I wanna note that uh, there's a, a phrase common in uh, financial circles uh, in repeated financial crises uh, that just before things get out of hand, you'll hear someone say, uh, you don't need to worry about this bubble or, or this mania because this time is different. Um, and so when I saw what was happening with the pandemic, I had a lot of concerns based on the historical record for um, what is a very, very long history of microfinance. Uh, if you saw my talk in 2019, uh, you'll recognize some of these pictures as we talk about uh, you know, microfinance, the industry today likes to think of itself as a relatively recent innovation. But the idea of credit for uh, lower income households and businesses is by no means new and goes all the way back to Hammurabi. Um, that second picture is Jonathan Swift who invented the product of microcredit almost exactly as we practice it today in the 1600s. In Germany in the 1700s and 1800s, we saw rural credit cooperatives doing much the same as what rural microfinance does today. Uh, France had a, a huge industry of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, small-scale lending uh, and banking uh, that was sort of hidden from uh, ideas of how banks really worked. In the United States, uh, in the early 1900s, there, uh, the, the uh, microfinance industry, although it wasn't called that at the, same, at the time, was so widespread that uh, there were many, many studies commissioned to understand what was happening with these um, small loans, as you see the title of that book, 10,000 Small Loans. So we have a lot of history to draw on to understand what's gone on uh, with microfinance in the past and what's happening uh, now. And one of the reasons I was concerned is that you get these uh, fairly common historical cycles where uh, when a crisis arrives, uh, the financial services institutions for lower income households uh, are the first ones to die. They're the first ones to die for two reasons. One, because the economics of providing uh, credit and savings to low income households in small amounts is very, very difficult. It's very, very hard uh, to do it, to do it well, uh, and to do it sustainably. And so when crisis hits, it hits those lower income households harder and therefore hits the financial institution serving them harder. Second is that historically, the institutions that provide uh, financial services to lower income households have been perceived to be the least important uh, financial services institutions. And so uh, regulators and governments didn't really think it was worth uh, saving those institutions, uh, supporting those institutions. They focused on the larger uh, banks. Um, and so uh, th the reason I, I draw this out is um, this time, at least so far, what we're seeing is something very, very different from historic crises that have affected financial services institutions. Uh, this time we have seen uh, a broad, widespread and broad recognition of how important these institutions are to economies overall and to the households that they serve and uh, a great deal of support. And so one of the commonalities we've seen is that um, I, I was coming into this very worried about funders pulling back. And what we've seen is uh, in many cases ex the exact opposite is that governments and funders uh, have stepped up to support the financial institutions, recognizing how important microfinance is uh, to low-income households. So that's a very important fact to recognize and lays the possibility that uh, you know, what comes next is uh, we're going to see those uh, uh, additional rays of light uh, in the microfinance industry being well poised uh, to play a vital role in recovery uh, for households, uh, small businesses, 
um, and, uh, and overall economies. But to do that, microfinance, I think, needs to continue to uh, evolve uh, what it is and how it conceives of itself. Um, uh, again, in my presentation uh, a couple of years ago, I talked about you know, really rethinking what the purpose of microfinance is. We have had this story that microfinance is primarily about small business credit to, to uh, fund growing businesses. Uh, but the reality is that we don't really see that in practice. We don't see the idea that uh, microfinance loans are um, uh, transforming businesses, raising, you know, creating lots of growing businesses with lots of employees, raising incomes. But that does not mean it's not important. What we've come to understand over the last 30 years is really seeing the, the lives of the kinds of customers that are microfinance clients and understanding them as uh, requiring three basic things and three very basic needs. And this pyramid that you see here is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, I think of this as a hierarchy of household financial needs. That first and foremost, households need to be able to manage liquidity. When they can manage liquidity, the ability to move money from one time period to another so that they can spend when they need to spend, they can save when they need to save, um, once they can do that, then they need tools to manage investment because almost every household does want to invest. They want to build a better future for themselves. So they need a way of accumulating enough money at one point in time to buy something, to invest in something that's going to provide future income. And of course, because these households are exposed to a lot of risk, they need the ability to manage those risks. Another way of thinking about this is that the lives of customers are um, uh, shaped by three uh, key concepts, three key ideas. So historically, we've thought of poverty primarily as insufficiency. Insufficiency meaning you just don't have enough money. And that is absolutely true, but it's not the whole picture of poverty. In fact, it leaves out some really important uh, factors of poverty that uh, we have to take into account if we're going to design the products that people are going to need to recover from the pandemic. So it isn't just that they don't have enough money, it's that their incomes uh, and their needs are unstable. They face a lot of instability. Those incomes vary up and down during the course of, uh, of days, of weeks, of months, of years. And so uh, even if they have enough money over some longer time period, they may not have enough money in the moment. Or if they have uh, money in the moment, they may not have uh, the confidence to be able to invest that money because of uh, risk that they're not going to have uh, that money in the future. And that's the fact the problem of illiquidity. So being able to move money from one uh, period of time to another. Sometimes you need to spend a large sum uh, in, in uh, all at one time. And so you need to pull income from the future into the present or draw income from the past into the present. Sometimes you need to take a big lump sum and you need to spend it slowly over time. So you need the ability to keep it safe so that you can take small amounts. If we conceive of microfinance as providing the tools to confront this reality of insu insufficiency, instability, and illiquidity, of providing the tools to manage liquidity, manage investment, and manage risk, that helps us think about what uh, household needs are and what product needs uh, are to help us deliver products that are better suited to the needs of customers. Now, there isn't a clear mapping between these needs and the products. Each of the main four products of microfinance uh, can be used to meet multiple of those needs. Payments, credit, savings, and insurance all help people accomplish uh, those different needs. Credit can be a liquidity management tool. It can be an investment managed tool. It can be a risk management tool. We've seen, for instance, in the pandemic, how important uh, additional credit has been to many small businesses to be able to manage the risk inherent in uh, coping with the pandemic. Uh, of course, we've seen the credit's role in managing liquidity and of course in managing investment. Savings have played a vital role too and have been a big part in many parts of the world of MFI's stability, that their ability to motivate savings has protected them uh, from some of the ups and downs of the pandemic. So if we're going to have a clear path forward, I do believe we need to start rethinking all of our products and, and the specifics of how those products are delivered, uh, not so much around a single idea of 
micro credit as a, a small business loan, but all of these tools, payment, credit, savings, and insurance as tools to meet these core needs, to manage liquidity, to manage investment, to manage risk, so that households can uh, cope with the challenges, uh, not only of insufficiency, but also of instability and illiquidity. Now, I'm sure much of the conversation for you uh, at this conference and uh, in your own institutions has been all about a digital transition. We've been talking about digital transitions in uh, microfinance for quite some time. Uh, the theme of the 2019 conference was demystifying digital. Um, but progress has been slow until the pandemic. Uh, and my friend Greg Chen from CGAP uh, has this phrase that I love to borrow because it's so perfect for uh, the questions that confront us on the digital side is that digital can build bridges and it can dig moats. So uh, the digital revolution that we've seen in talking to the Sentinels and watching MFIs, uh, you know, they've really been nudged hard, pushed hard into leaning into digital because of the pandemic and, and lockdowns, using uh, WhatsApp and other ways of communicating with customers, starting to accept digital payments and working with customers uh, to get them comfortable with digital payments, designing products that can be delivered digitally, uh, reaching out to customers, you know, the end of in-person meetings and figuring out ways to, to use digital tools to maintain customer relationships. That's been an incredibly important bridge uh, that has helped uh, both MFIs cope themselves, but also their customers cope. Uh, and it's been amazing and wonderful to see uh, the, the innovation and the resilience of microfinance institutions around the world in using technologies to, to build bridges. Um, but at the same time, uh, digital can be a moat. It, it can be a barrier to uh, the, the traditionally marginalized customers that microfinance was in, invented to serve. Um, the, you know, the overlap between poverty and digital illiteracy is very, very high. The overlap between uh, difficulty accessing the technologies and uh, rural, uh, customers is very, very high. And so there's a concern too that digital not only can be a bridge, but if it's not used very intentionally, it does create barriers. It makes it even harder for the marginalized customers to engage in, uh, in microfinance, to connect with microfinance institutions, to figure out how to make finance work for them. And that's traditionally been a big part of the work of microfinance. It's one of the reasons it's so very, very difficult to do is, uh, you know, it, microfinance institutions have taken up the challenge of reaching uh, uh, customers who are thought to be unreachable, of bringing people into the system who are thought to be well beyond the system, outside the castle walls, you might say. My fear is that in these transitions uh, that are happening very, very rapidly, that it's very easy to lose sight of the people who are not making the transition. Uh, if we're only using digital tools, or as we rely more on digital tools, uh, it, it tends to um, erase or, or hide the people who are not there. So, uh, you know, there's this uh, mythos uh, around uh, digital and uh, the internet, the idea of uh, mass customization, that um, these uh, digital tools allow you to deliver a customized product to, to every customer. And that is, that, that myth is not entirely unfounded, but it's not really the whole story. Much of the story of digitization, of digitalization, is about homogenization, about delivering the exact same product to a le very large number of people. That makes it very cheap. It changes the economics of delivery often, and therefore means that more mainstream institutions may be more interested in serving some of the lower income customers because they can serve them more cheaply using digital technology. However, uh, that homogenization also is you know, directly contradictory to a lot of the idea and the success of microfinance of uh, holding hands, of, of going to the people to, to work with them, to, to bring them into the system, to customize products to them, to help them engage uh, with the financial system that they may not be comfortable with. And so uh, I think we have to constantly confront this issue of 
what digital is going to do, how we use it to customize rather than homogenize, how we um, don't uh, allow a, a, a huge swath of customers to be newly excluded uh, by a digital moat. Now, this does present a very uh, specific challenge to microfinance institutions, because um, if digital technologies allow more mainstream financial institutions to, shall we say, cherry pick uh, the customers who are comfortable with digital, who are also likely to be the wealthier, better off, more savvy customers, that puts a lot of pressure on microfinance institutions, uh, you know, potentially losing some of their better, most profitable clients uh, and putting more uh, pressure on their uh, on MFI's own finances. And so it is important th that MFI's invest here and work really hard to uh, you know, maintain what's distinct about microfinance, uh, maintain those client relationships and not lose sight of microfinance's role of bringing more people into the formal financial sector. And of course, there's another big concern uh, that I worry doesn't get enough attention. Uh, and I hope you'll forgive me for using uh, the memes to illustrate this, but uh, you know, cybersecurity remains a very, very big problem that I don't think is getting nearly enough attention um, in, in global circles around uh, microfinance. Uh, you know, as I've mentioned, many of the customers that microfinance uh, focuses on are less technologically savvy. And so uh, they are more vulnerable potentially to cybersecurity risks. And you know, we're not going to solve this problem with digital literacy. Uh, I uh, have spent a lot of time looking at financial literacy, which is often uh, put out there as, a, uh, as a, a, a way of fixing financial inclusion. And the fact is financial literacy does not work. It does not make a meaningful difference in outcomes. Uh, and that's because it's incredibly hard to teach uh, knowledge um, to people and, and change their behavior. Changing behavior is a very different uh, set of interventions than teaching knowledge. Digital literacy is not going to fix the cybersecurity problem. So we've got a problem on the customer side of cybersecurity, but we also have a big problem within MFIs on cybersecurity. Dealing with cybersecurity is incredibly difficult and it's constantly changing. And the people who know what they're doing are expensive and in very high demand. And uh, microfinance in uh, in institutions around the world are struggling to uh, build a robust and secure digital presence because the people who can help them do that uh, are uh, being hired by the banks and many other organizations who uh, put, uh, can afford to pay very, very high salaries. Uh, to retain those people. And so MFIs are really often caught in a vice. Uh, they, um, they don't want to expose themselves or their customers to risk, uh, but they uh, have a, a, a whole lot of expense and difficulty of ensuring their security. And so this is something I'm going to be watching very, very carefully over the next couple of years uh, as we've made this very, very rapid transition to digital because of the pandemic. How do we manage the questions of cybersecurity? Um, I'd love to hear from you uh, on how that's happening in your institutions and how you're managing cybersecurity risks effectively within an MFI framework. Now, all of that being said, um, I'm going to uh, minimize things and uh, wrap up here to say, I am very encouraged about how microfinance has weathered the pandemic. I'm very encouraged that the institutions have by and large remained strong and found ways uh, to meet customer needs. And I truly believe that microfinance institutions are going to be a, uh, are, need to be a bedrock of the recovery from the pandemic. And so uh, let me close by uh, giving you my best wishes both for this conference, but also on that uncertain road ahead. Uh, that uh, microfinance institutions and microfinance leaders uh, have done amazing work. There's hard work ahead, but absolutely vital work to the recovery of countries and of communities from the pandemic. Thank you for your time. And please do reach out with your ideas on how uh, the road ahead is looking for you. Keep track of the Sentinel project. And I will look forward to being with you again in person next year. Thank you, Tim. This was great. I actually noted down, down a few points uh, from your speech. Um, these are important uh, messages that uh, 
I think our members and practitioners uh, appreciate, but also they will inform our programs, MFC, thinking about the future and strategy. So uh, your main point, I think, was that digitalization can be a barrier and we should be aware of it. And um, that uh, there is actually a mythos of uh, what you call uh, mass digitalization, um, which is not the whole story, of course, and uh, um, delivering the same product to a huge number of customers may mean that we actually exclude people that we should be bringing to the system. So it's uh, really critical to think how to customize versus how to homogenize. This is, I think, a very important point. Another issue is about cybersecurity. This topic is um, really neglected and it concerns both the client level and the institutional level. And as you rightly said, the financial literacy does not work. More knowledge doesn't mean more skills. Uh, and we have to be thinking about changing people's behavior. So I think it's also a critical point. As I think many practitioners actually realize the barriers that uh, digitalization brings, but uh, they put uh, a lot of hopes in financial literacy. Um, by delivering classical knowledge, and this may not be the way to go forward. So we have to be thinking more how to change people's uh, behavior. And finally, I, I'm really encouraged by your um, idea of thinking about nuancing microfinance products and uh, thinking not in terms of developing clients' businesses, but uh, managing clients' liquidity, investment and risk. I think it's also a very important point and great uh, food for thought. Thank you, Tim. Now moving to the next item on the agenda, I am sure that most of you are familiar with the European Union Code of Good Conduct for Microcredit Provision. The code uh, defines a unique set of standards of the microfinance sector in Europe. It serves as a self-regulation tool and a quality label for institutions committed to social and ethical finance. Since the introduction of the code, many EU microfinance institutions have taken the assessment and certification process. And we would like to acknowledge the MFIs, members of MFC, that have been certified since October last year. They include in alphabetical order, Albanian Social Fund, BCRS Business Loans from the UK, BCR Social Finance from Romania, BDB Microfinancing from Bulgaria, Fondi Besa from Albania and Ustoy from Bulgaria. Congratulations to all of you. And for the acknowledgement, I would like to invite Anne Branch, uh, head of unit at the European Commission, DG Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. Anne, over to you. Dear colleagues, I'm sorry we can't meet in person yet, but I'm delighted to have this opportunity to say a few words at your conference. And I'd like to begin by thanking the Microfinance Centre for organising the event and for creating this moment of recognition for the institutions who've been awarded the European Code of Good Conduct for Microcredit Provision. The Code is an important part of European Union support for microfinance, which was originally put in place some 10 years ago in the aftermath of the last financial crisis. By getting involved in this field back then, we wanted to support inclusive job creation and to empower all potential entrepreneurs, whatever their backgrounds. At the same time, we wanted to do this in a way which ensures ethical standards for the sector in Europe. The code is therefore an important voluntary self-regulation instrument for microfinance institutions. It's a benchmark for the best lending practices in the sector. The code was first developed in 2011 and updated in 2019 based on recognised best practices and in close consultation with stakeholders. And it has by now become a recognised quality label. For micro-entrepreneurs applying for a loan, it provides assurance that the microfinance institutions operate in a fair and ethical manner. For investors and funders, it ensures that the sector operates with transparent and pan-EU reporting standards. And for regulators, it's a reassurance that the sector operates according to sound business practices and that it's well governed. Since 2014, signing up to or endorsing the code has been a precondition for accessing European microfinance funding under the EU programme for employment and social innovation. And this requirement will continue under the forthcoming InvestEU programme. But as well as enabling access to EU support, 
implementing the code has other real benefits, including enhancing the reputation of microcredit providers among their customers and existing partners. As of today, a total of 155 non-bank microfinance institutions have signed up to the code and 81 banks have endorsed it. Among the 155, a total of 56 institutions have gone through the evaluation and been awarded the code. Our data suggests that the code is really working in raising standards across Europe, as microcredit providers have made a number of changes to improve their practices. So I'd like to take this occasion to applaud these 56 institutions in 20 European countries for their efforts and commitment to comply with the code and to strive for high standards for the sector. In doing so, you're contributing to ethical lending standards and to building a more resilient and inclusive Europe. Micro enterprises represent over 90% of enterprises in Europe and the microfinance sector is therefore vital for the European economy and its recovery from the pandemic. So thank you once again to the Microfinance Centre for your support for the sector and congratulations to the institutions who have been awarded the code. Thank you, Anne, and congratulations again to all certified MFC members that expanded this family of the institutions in the EU that uh, are high quality institutions and are recognized by this EU label. We, we encourage more of MFIs, including MFC members, to enter the process of evaluation and certification, especially that is highly supported by technical assistance in preparation process and can bring many benefits um, also in the organizational development for those uh, institutions. Again, big uh, congratulations to Albanian Social Fund, BCRS Business Loans from the UK, BCR Social Finance from Romania, BDB Microfinance from Bulgaria, Fondi Besa from Albania and Ustoy from Bulgaria for um, getting this certification and being part of the this family of um, EU code certified institutions. I also encourage you to come today at 11 a.m. and meet the leaders. Uh, there will be a special session sharing good practice experience and the code with um, our code hour this uh, from last uh, year. Again, congratulations and encouragement for all the others to join the family. Now the, the conference platform that we are using has lots of interesting features that will allow you to network, meet your peers, meet investors, uh, go to sessions, attend roundtables, etc. So I would like my colleague Kinga to guide us, navigate us through the platform so that you can take full advantage of it. So uh, welcome again. Hope you had a good day yesterday. And for those who join us uh, for the first time today, um, I would like to give you a brief introduction uh, to the platform so you can benefit from all the features uh, which are available uh, at the platform. So when you log in, you go to the reception and at the reception, you can find information what is happening now. Uh, there are some information uh, left by us, uh, MFC. You can find information who is uh, supporting the conference, who is our partner, as well as check the whole agenda for today. Uh, the sessions uh, which are live have the button uh, in red now. On the left, on the right side, you have a few buttons. Chat is where you can place any information, uh, thoughts, questions to, to all participants of the con conference. Polls is where we prepared some questions to you uh, to, to vote. Once you vote, you can find how other people think and, and vote it as well. People, that's one of the most important buttons for all of us. Uh, you can find here all the people who registered to the conference. You can search to find somebody or you can just scroll down. So once you find the person you want to contact, you can do a few things. You can click on the person name and you can invite the person to video call. Once you click, the special link will be created only for you and that person to join. And you will have a private room where you can uh, conversate. You can also schedule a meeting with that person. You can select a time and send invitation to that person. Also, you can, you can chat 
So you can just write a message to that person saying, for example, hello. So use that opportunity to find who is participating at our conference and network with people. On the left side, we have a few buttons. Reception is where you start. Plenary is where we are now. So when you join the plenary, you can find out who is talking and plenaries are happening every morning at nine o'clock. Sessions are like workshops. So you can join any session which is listed here. The sessions open five minutes before uh, the scheduled time. The only session which is open all the time is help desk. So if you have any technical problems, you can join this session and ask the question in the chat to, 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 and we will help you. Networking, that's another great opportunity for you. You can go there and join, join the networking area. It's like a speed dating for professionals, but better because you join. Please make sure that you allow your uh, mic and camera to be visible. You apply and you will be connected with somebody randomly. Uh, it may take a few minutes to find a person. Uh, you will be connected only once to a person. However, if you want to communicate longer, you can exchange virtual cards with that person. Partner stage. It's where our partners uh, prepared special uh, materials and information for you. So we have EIB group, where you can find information about the sessions planet, uh, contacts, and you can find more information uh, about them. Another, another booth which is worth visiting is uh, Responsibility, our other partner where you again can find out more information about them. You can contact them, ask them questions, comment. So use that opportunity. Singlify is another, another partner which uh, helps us build this conference. So you can again find information about, uh, about them. You can, you can check what they are doing. You can ask a question. You can comment their product. I encourage you to do. And the last, Frankfurt School. You can check what they prepared for you. They will have a special session uh, for you today. There are also some special discounts only for the conference participants. So visit their booth to learn more. And when you get tired and you need a moment of relax, use our relax zone when you can hear to some relaxation music for a couple of minutes to relax between jumping into the next session. So thank you, and I hope you will enjoy uh, the rest of the day. Thank you, Kinga, so much. So let's find out what's uh, on the agenda for today, Kasia. Uh, so let me share with you further highlights of the today's agenda. I encourage you to uh, come and meet our colleagues of Frankfurt School and Management, our academic partner, Today at 10 a.m., they prepared a special, special, special session for you, as well as uh, super uh, discounts for their uh, outstanding courses. So please uh, come and take advantage uh, of it. If you are interested in trends, um, today we continue with our regional roundtables. And today, roundtable uh, will focus on Central Asia and Caucasus with special focus on Central Asia. Uh, this roundtable is uh, prepared for you in cooperation with uh, Microfinance Association from Kyrgyzstan and uh, it will start at 10 and, and will be held in Russian. Uh, so I encourage also our Russian speaker, speaking participants to come and join the session and share your thoughts, uh, trends you observe uh, in Central Asian region. Another trending session will present the trends in rural finance uh, and uh, this will be available at 1 uh, p.m. So I also encourage you to come and uh, look at the rural finance trends. We will also continue the topic of the impact of uh, the pandemic on microfinance. And I would like to invite you to a dedicated session on lessons learned from the pandemic that will take place today at 12 a.m. 
Throughout the whole conference, we run a series of sessions called Meet with Leaders, and today's focus is on digitalization. So we continue the discussion that Tim already started this morning. Come and learn about practical experiences of Microfin at 1040, KMF at 1140, Microinvest at 1240, and Alter Modus at 140. We also encourage you to attend the session at 11 a.m. that I already mentioned and meet with the leaders that are uh, EU code certified. Um, yeah, please join us for those sessions. And don't forget about the networking possibilities. Try at least once. I feel that yesterday we uh, went to sessions. They, um, the participation was quite significant, but we sort of neglected meeting each other, talking to each other, which is the core of um, the MFC conferences. I managed to meet a few interesting people yesterday just by clicking the join button on the uh, network the networking area. I encourage you to do that as well so that um, you can meet people. Yes, be brave. And it's like, you know, with the speed dating, you never know who you are going to meet. Yesterday, I met a few totally new people that I met for the first time. And uh, um, greetings to all of those that we shortly met yesterday, but also people that I know. But it was really great to get an update how you are doing, how the pandemic is influencing the sector in your country. So there's really plenty of opportunities to catch up on since uh, we've been, you know, locked down and had limited uh, uh, travel and meeting opportunities because of the pandemic. So please take advantage uh, of it and uh, uh, talk to your peers from other countries, from, from other institutions. And um, I, I strongly encourage you to do it. And as we have still 13 minutes left, uh, uh, before the start of the next session's round, grab your coffee like we do here and go to the networking area and be brave and meet somebody new, meet somebody that you know and ask them how they feel, how they like this conference and how they are doing out there in their countries um, in different, we, we have participants uh, now over 800, 800 people registered from almost 80 countries, so I think uh, we can really exchange on how the things are going uh, uh, across Europe, Central Asia, but also in other continents. So enjoy network and see you back shortly at 10 a.m. sharp when we start our next round of sessions. Enjoy the second day of the conference. <laughs>